Welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. Uh, we have a very special guest tonight. He is both a reverend and a doctor, Reverend Dr. Christopher Macklin, PhD. He's a medical intuitive, a paranormal conduit, spiritual teacher, health and wellness practitioner, a UFO expert, a remote viewer, an energetic healer. He assists people in achieving optimal spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical health. He lectures on the physical, spiritual, and emotional guides uh, to health and wellness. He specializes in healing abductees and others who have suffered related re, re, related negative ET trauma. He assists people in removing negative ET presences from their lives, clear, clearing homes and land, and closing multi, multi-dimensional portals. He also works tirelessly with Illuminati fallout children, Mind controlled and physically tortured by ET influenced governmental agencies uh, and institutions. In addition, he works very closely with the Pleiadians and Arcturians to help pull and rebalance humanity. His work addresses a wide range of mind, body, spirit imbalances to overall wellness, is well received and resonates well with the general public. And he has a book uh, entitled History, Truth, and healing, uh, which addresses the negative ET presence and how it has affected humanity and is available and on Amazon. Welcome, uh, a warm welcome, Dr. Reverend Christopher Macklin to tonight's show. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Thanks for having me. Bless your heart. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, you are in near Branson, Missouri. Yeah, yeah, just outside. Um, I mean, in fact, it's a long story, but we're building a house on 40 acres about 20 minutes away. So we had to move into the ministry building for what we thought was a short while. It's been two years, but the house is almost finished. So we'll be moving back out. The ministry building's here. And it's in uh, Hollister, just outside Branson, Missouri. So I love it here. Uh, I hate to get technical here, but how much is the cost of an acre in your future neighborhood uh well, it's, it's a lot speaking. cheaper probably about um five thousand dollars an acre somewhere like probably gone it's, up now but, it's not uh, too it bad was. it's not too bad it no could, no yeah it sounds like it you're not worse. very close to the city uh well 20 minutes away it's a small village uh and you know well it's a small town um a really nice town actually i love it but it's in the woods, you know, it's completely wooded and I love wood, you know, I love trees, uh, lots of animals there. Coyotes, 20 minutes you know. from yeah. Branson? Yeah, 20 and minutes how, from Branson. How far is that from Springfield? Uh, Branson is about 40 minutes from Springfield. Oh, so you're an hour from a big, from the biggest city in the state. Yeah, absolutely. And how are the winters there in Missouri? Cold. <laughs> I was introduced to the item called the Carhartt, <laughs> so, you know, the uh, flannels that people have, you know, so I've officially become a hillbilly, well, I'm British, but uh, because, you know, it's pretty cold here, so you need, you know, good flannels to keep you warm, so, but it is pretty cold in the winter, um, but so, very hot in the summer. So is it usually, usually above or below freezing most of the winter? Uh, most of the winter below freezing, yeah, it goes to, can get up to minus 15 sometimes. Did get, I think it was last year, up, up to minus 22. And what's, so the, pretty, what's the average temperature uh, for the w- whole winter on most winters, do you think? Uh, probably probably five, some like that, seven. Five you know. or seven? Wow, that's impressive. I, I was up on a top of a house on a roof one time in Texas, and it was 11 degrees, and uh, that was considered kind of cold for them. For Texas. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, of all the things you talk about, what uh, what topic, I know what your book is about. It's about uh, the different diseases that we have. But if, if somebody got you in an elevator and they said, in 15 seconds, tell me what you have the deepest expertise in, what would you say to them in 15 seconds? Uh, I would say a lot of aspects, um, but one of the most uh, prominent things that is coming up at the moment is uh, entity presence 
exorcisms, you know, and people being attacked by entities, both uh, physically, mentally, um, and also sexually, which is uh, becoming shocking because, you know, people are being raped by entities at the moment. Uh, so, and that's getting more prompt, I think, because as the uh, vibration rises of people, they want to try and strike you down. So they're getting a lot more um, uh, prevalent in their attacks uh, more than I've seen before. And I'm getting a lot of people who are being attacked relentlessly to try and shut them down with fear. So when you say entities, um, you mention, uh, or I read part of your bio and it, it mentions ETs, but um, one of the other people I interviewed very recently was um, more on the demonic side. So do you uh, see that side as well, personally? Oh, yeah, that's the a, that's a demonic side, attacking people, for sure. I mean, what what's the entities we're talking about? Well, you know, I love Jesus' teachings. I'm not a Christian, but I love Jesus' teachings. And he talked about demonic entities, but encompassed them all in one demonic, you know, dark uh, thing, which is fine. But but I've separated them out and understood that, you know, there's there's various factions all working together to shut down the human race by fear. So what are they? Well, you've got Anunnaki, the uh, reptilian creatures. They actually live under the planet. You know, uh, they can't breathe the oxygen up here, so they live under the planet. Uh, you've got Draconians, uh, and that's where Dracula comes from. They're very dark. If they attach to you, they can attach you because they live in a different time but same space, so you can't see them because they're in a different frequency, the fourth dimension, shall we say. So what happens is when they when they attach to you, they're an energy that's attached to you, of course, but they can do uh, pretty crazy things. You've got greys. We've all heard about the greys, uh, the grey reticular. Um, they were banned off the planet, and I was actually at a meeting in Galactic Federation. It was in 2017, and it was deemed that, you know, because they're abducting people, there's a very close call between violation and education. So what do we mean by that? Well, you know, when you come to this planet, they show you, look, you've got these entities that are going to try and attack you, and, da, 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 and you have to learn how they work and use maps of intent. I don't like the word prayer, but maps of intent to block them out. That's fine. So when you come here, is that a violation? No, it's an education because you're learning how to survive in an entity-ridden, you know, environment. But with the greys, of course, with their ships, they've been abducting people. So they've been abducting people, taking people on the ship, stealing their eggs, sperm, and you know, different things, and then putting them back down here. Now, is that an education? No, it's a complete violation because they're paralyzed and they didn't give informed consent or any consent uh, to steal their body parts. So the Galactic Federation, we had a meeting. Um, I chair it with other th two that beings and we talked about it for a while, and it was agreed that the Actorians would take them off the planet. So they did. So what's interesting is now, uh, they're very cheeky. What they're doing is, instead of being here physically, what they're doing is coming down through portals. So they're in a different time space. So they've got around the rules. So whether, you know, we'll have another beast about that, I don't know. But they're still met playing with people. Uh, and it's interesting because a lot of people in the houses sometimes have portals. And they have, they, the thing is about these beings is they don't wash, so they smell like gone off drain. And sometimes people have walked in the house, like in the living room, and think, why does it smell like gone off drain? There's nothing on my drains, there's nothing wrong with the plumbing, and people have had plumbers out and everything else, couldn't get rid of the smell. And it's because you've got a portal open, and, you know, I can shut them down and remove them, and then suddenly the, the smell completely goes. And then you've also got, um, you've also got two more major ones, which is... Um, Archons. Uh, archons float through the second, third, or fourth dimension. They have no body. They're just basically an energetic being, but they can attach to you. And then there's also um, Luciferians, which are connected to the Vatican, of course. Uh, very dark beings, but they're more snarly. They're a bit like what Jesus was describing as like, you know, someone's possessed because they'll contort your body or speak through your voice box in a snarly, raspy voice. So I've seen the attacks have uh, been way, way more prominent in the last year or two than I've seen in a long time. And I think it's because they're, they're trying to really suppress people. And, you know, it's a spiritual battle, dark versus light. Uh, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been pretty crazy.
So what's the um, most common type of attachment that you've seen? Anunnaki. I would say 87% of people um, normally when they come for healing, oh sorry, 99% of people when they come for healing have got an attachment. And I would say 87% of those are uh, Anunnaki. But you do get, you know, Luciferians uh, now and again. You do get, I had a draconian attached to a woman last week. She got really sick. They're probably the darkest being because what they do is they tap in the lower back and through your spinal cord, they can send you thoughts. You know, they're very clever. And so if you go out, you know, and do your job or whatever you do, and there's, God, you're useless. That was pathetic. No one likes you. You get all these thoughts coming in. And then they're you thoughts. You are. They're not allowed to say I and and it's very easy for us to not recognize a thought and say, oh, yeah, it's me, it's me, it's me. And then, you know, people start to get depressed because all they're hearing is you're useless, you're pathetic, you know, you shouldn't be here, no one likes you, da, da, da. And if you get that 24-7, it sends people over the edge. And so it's very important, you know, I think for the viewers, if you are getting negative thoughts like this, really pay attention. Is that a you thought, you, or is it an I thought? And it's not, it's a you thought. And so, you know, very important to remove those. And I remove them, you know, I remove a lot every week. I mean, we work probably on about 2,000 people a week. Uh, you know, with general groups, we have specialized groups, we have one-to-ones. And, uh, you know, I'm seeing this a lot. And, of course, when they attach you, because they sit in, you know, Anunnaki and Draconians, they sit in the abdomen, hang on the shoulders, so shoulders and neck are always tight. It bloats the abdomen because it's paralyzed the low intestine. So when you eat... As the food goes further down, it backs up, you feel blah, you know, bloaty, abdomen swells, liver and kidneys get affected because it's dropped the vibration, so the, the, the liver's not processing uh, toxins, and so you get like brain fog, and this is all kind of tantamount to fibromyalgia. So, uh, you know, they cause a lot of problems with people's bodies, and by removing them and revibrating the organs and getting the, the whole body rebalanced, uh, people feel like amazing. I spoke to the lady today who had a draconian and she said, wow, I just, it's like night and day. I feel amazing, you know. So you don't, uh, you don't think uh, demons are a big percentage of what you're saying? Oh, they're all demonic. All, all those beings are demonic, yeah, because they're negative. Negative entities, as I call them, or demonic, whatever you want to call them. So, you know. Uh, Anunnaki, Draconians, uh, Luciferians, Archons, uh, all demonic beings. Um, so when you say Luciferians, then, what, what exactly do you mean? Um, Luciferians are just another form of uh, reptilian being. Uh, they're connected to the Vatican and they, you know, um, people say Lucifer is of the light. Uh, mm, absolutely not, you know, and... Uh, and it's connected to the Vatican. It's 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 pushed all over the world. They have Luciferian symbology and all this sort of thing. So you know, if you look at the Vatican, the way it's laid out, it's all Luciferian symbology. Very interesting. So if somebody told you you had an imp, IMP, what would you say? Tell me what an IMP is. That's a small demon. Oh, the small ones. Yeah. Um, if it's small, do you, yeah, you do get other factions, but I don't see them very often. But if they if they had one, I'd remove it. And how do we remove it? Well, you know, when I do the healing, I put people in portals, which means that, you know, you detach from the energy, then Belchizedek beings can come through and do work. So what they can do is escort these beings out of the body. And that's what we always do now. People always say, well, you know, all you have to do is say, in the name of the Lord, get out of my body. The problem with that is you've got to safely deliver them somewhere. Because if you don't, if you just say, all right, get out of my body, you're going to upset the being. It'll get very stressed. It, it'll it'll leave uh, for a short while. But if you're in like a church or some big area, it's going to attach to somebody else pretty quickly. So um, where were you born? Uh, Chester in England. It's actually 20 minutes from Liverpool, 30 minutes from Manchester. So how long were you in England before you moved to America? I moved here in 2010 and uh, became a citizen in 2017. So, so you, I love it over <clears throat> So how long did you live in England? Uh, 
Just well, ballpark. Till two, it doesn't have to be exact. Till, till 2007. So How um, many I was born years in 62. So you were born in 62. Um, so yeah, you're, you're younger than I was me. about 44. Yeah, I'm 61. 44 right. years. Yeah, so yeah. You're, you're a year younger than me. I was born 61. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a year older than you. So, yeah, but Charles, I asked for a discount this year. You know, when I had my birthday, I said, God, I want a discount. They said, Yeah, you can have 30 years off. So I'm trying, I'm under the belief that I'm 31 just for this year. <laughs> well, um, so did you, uh, what was your childhood like in, in general? I mean, did you have anything happen to you that was unusual when you were a child? Oh, yeah. The first. The first demonic entity I ever encountered was uh, in my bedroom. I was four years old. And I remember this big reptilian thing, you know, um, it looked like a dinosaur thing sitting and I could see it because I can see through the veil. I can see beings attached to people. So I was lying in bed and, you know, I saw this thing. And when they're, when they're close to you, you get this like dark as anything feeling in your chest. Like, wow, this is not good. I said, Dad, Dad, there's a dinosaur thing, you know, because I didn't know about reptilians then, of course. I just said, there's a dinosaur thing in my room. It's there, you know, and he comes running. And what's, what's the matter? What's the matter? It's there. And he goes, um, I think it's a bad dream, darling. But it's there, you know. And anyway, go back to sleep. And it stayed there, of course. So, um, so I just got this intuition, even, even at the age of four, get out of my bedroom. It went. Thought, oh, that worked. And from there, I could actually start to manage them. Uh, and then, you know, crazy things happened because when I was born, um, uh, two days later, I was in hospital for a year with eight strokes. Uh, I got attacked right from birth. Then I came out of hospital and then at the age of four, I think it was interfered with and a, a pot of tea went over my back and burnt my back really badly. So I went back in hospital for another year. Oh, and, you know, these things... Back These up for a are, second. You said you were born, you were attacked at birth. Yeah. Uh, please, if you wouldn't uh, mind, go over that event. Well, the interesting thing is that uh, they know. I mean, I obviously can't remember because you're just born, and you know, I always laugh because when you're born, you come out of the vaginal opening. There's the IRS in the corner. Welcome to Mother Earth. Here's your invoice, and then it, it goes downhill from that. But they know, you know, there's a, a big element of star seeds down here. There's probably about 400,000 star seed people. What does that mean? Well, star seed people mean they volunteered to come down. And of course, when you sip in champagne with God and, you know, everything's high vibrational and loving, you think, oh, yeah, I can do this planet, no problem. And I'll get in the queue and I'll volunteer. And then you get down here, they, oh, my goodness. What was I thinking? Because I, I see so many people, I don't belong here. This is not my planet. Uh, well, it is. You volunteered. So we've got to show up. And the whole point about this is get into grips with these demonic entities so they can't attack you. How do we do that? Well, over a period of time, first of all, we have a prayer, the 27 Easter at Merkapal Field in quotes prayer or map of intent. And it's actually, we've got a book about the sacred prayers. If anyone wants one, it's, it's the sacred prayers. Um, it's got every single one in there. So, uh, by putting 27 East Out Merkabah fields around you, it protects you. So these entities can't get in whilst you're raising your vibration. Now, if you don't raise your vibration, of course, they can just attach to it if you don't protect yourself. But once you raise your vibration over a certain level, it's way higher than them. It means you're like a brick wall. They can't get near your energy field. And that's one of the keys that, you know, that's why I'm a... A birdie, really a facilitator to help people get back to their guru self. I don't believe in gurus, you know, all that stuff is gone. You know, you are your own guru. And the whole point about this is getting people back to their guru self. So they're leaping out of bed and, oh, my God, I feel incredible. And then, you know, you can step out in the world. So, so have you ever run across people who, um, how do I put this? They, they go around breaking people's uh, protection barriers. Have you ever come across people like that? Oh, yeah, an absolute ton. I've had people put in spells, curses, send them negative energy, and, and it happens, you know. Um, uh, you know, uh, if they do black magic rituals, you're going to get negative energy. And, uh, you know, I create, create ceremonies to break that down, basically, uh, you know, breaking all spells, curses, and rituals. And then what we do is... We bring the person before God for justice in only the way God knows how and release them to God with unconditional love and forgiveness. And it starts to break down their power. 
But that happens a lot, you know, even in America, all over the world, there's satanic rituals, very, very dark satanic rituals. So uh, you don't, you said you were attacked at birth. How much of that do you remember? Um, I don't, I remember when I was four, um, this, this pot of tea knocked over my back. But of course, when you're just straight away born, um, I've looked back at it and uh, the reptilians uh, were uh, attacking relentlessly because they know who's coming and they try and shut you down um, right at birth. And, uh, you know, like I say, I, from the birth trauma or whatever trauma it was, I had eight strokes, I'm still here. You know? So, um, and they've tried not just the, it's not just the beings, it's actually deep state people. It's all connected. Deep state, all these See? beings, they're all working together. You've had eight strokes? Yeah, both, yeah, yeah. You, you Eight strokes, you've had eight strokes. Eight strokes, yeah, and I'm still here. I'm still living, but I've got so, scar tissue on my brain. How were you when you had your first stroke? Uh, two days old. Two days? Two days old, had a stroke, had another one half a day later, another one a day later, and, you know, went all week. And, so they informed uh, you of this, you didn't remember it. No, no, I mean, they told my father, you know, and uh, they, I mean, in those days, you just, I guess, get blood thinner and, you well, know, uh, okay, live there so, still. So what kind of strokes did you have? Did you have, there's two types, right? There's the type where the blood stops because there's a barrier in the blood vessel. And then there's a type where the blood vessel bursts. Two different, which type did you have? Blood vessel bursting. Yeah, there are two types of stroke. Yeah. Because, I mean, at that age, you wouldn't have any, you would like to think you wouldn't have any blockages in your capillaries, you know, in the brain. So, absolutely, it, it was just a blood vessel burst and, you know, a bleed and then another bleed then another bleed. Uh, amazing. My, my wife had two strokes. She had one where the blood vessel was clogged and one where the blood vessel burst. So she had, she said one of each. Uh, anyway, so back to you. Um when you saw the being in your room, did it scare you first? Oh, yeah, at first. Oh, that's why I've called for, oh, dad, dad, there's, there's a dinosaur thing in here, you know. And, uh, of course, he doesn't have the gift to see them. So, that, well, it's just a bad dream. There's nothing here. It's fine. So what, and it was still standing there. It was in the corner of the room, you know, crazy. Did you ever find out what it was exactly, for sure? Yeah, Anunnaki, yeah. Okay. It, it was a, um, the, the, the thing is about Anunnaki, they're about between 10 and 15 feet tall. They live probably 1,200 years. They live a lot longer than us. So, and as they, as they grow older, they get darker. Who's, the, who's at the top of the food chain on the dark, in the dark zone? Uh, the Draconians. They're, they're above, on, above the, uh, the regular demons that people talk about? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they're all, to me, they're all regular demons. And one of the biggest de demonic attacks is Luciferians, you know, because Luciferians can talk the body and people get possessed, they can't control their body. And, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of Luciferians. But to me, they're all demonic, you know, they're all negative entities trying to manipulate and trying to shut you down and scare you, you know. And of course, when I saw this like 10 foot two thing, you know, standing in the corner of the room, like, oh, you know, what, what are we going to do with that? And my father couldn't see it. So how long did it take you to become proficient at controlling them or getting them to do Believe it or not, pretty quickly, you know. Um, I mean, that night, I thought, you know, I just got this inspiration. Like, Get out of my room with all my mind. It went, you know, because if you command something, the, the universal law is it's got to leave if it's not in your space. So it left. But, of course, I still got attacks. And every time I saw them, I just, like, you know, command them to leave and they left. But it takes a lot of power, you know, and even the age of four, I seem to have the power. So, but I also saw craft in the sky, which, you know, is interesting as well, because I can see through the veil. Some of these craft actually are the same space, different time. They, they switch out so they're invisible, but the energy field's still there. And, and I could see these craft. I said, Dad, there's a, there's a flying saucer over there. Where? You know, they couldn't see it, you know, so... Um, but I learned very quickly that if I continue on this um, on this uh, narrative and tell them about it, uh, they're probably going to put me in a mental institute. So I stopped talking about it. I saw them, but I learned to just mm, let's let's be quiet. And I still see them now. You know. 
So when when did you start opening back up to where you didn't care what people thought about what you told, said about them? When did that happen? I would say, I mean, I was meant to be a, what they call a sleeper, where I didn't do anything. You know, I did a degree, did a master's degree. Avionics systems worked on all sorts of aircraft autopilot systems and different things. And then uh, in 2007, I went completely bankrupt. You know, um, I made so much money then. I was building houses. And then I had this bright, I was just refurbing houses, keeping some of them and selling some of them. And this great idea, why don't we do 173 apartments in Manchester? What a great idea. Not. Anyway, I thought I could do it. So, you know, bought the land. It was millions of pounds and all this sort of thing. And then suddenly the crash. The bank phoned me up and said, do you know these apartments that you believe uh, are worth $220,000? They're now worth ninety. dollars You've got 14 days to pay our money back. I thought, oh, I don't see I said, well, £10 do. <laughs> uh, from then, <clears throat> I lost. I just completely let go of anything to do with money, stuff, and anything else. Went bankrupt, got divorced, you know, kind of lived out of a car for a bit. Um, you know, sometimes I got a free, if people, you know, sometimes people would say, well, what's what's your story? Well, I do healings, I da, 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 went bankrupt. And, well, I'll tell you what, you know, give me a healing and I'll, I'll get you a hotel room. But I had absolutely zero money, but I had zero debt as well. And it was quite freeing. So I spent a lot of time meditating, understanding how the healing works. And from then it took off. And then I ended up in Belize, which is interesting. I went to Belize because uh, I met this nice Templar guy. He said, oh, you got to go to Belize. I'm building something out there. And he, he paid for the, the ticket. And he said, oh, there's money for food there. When I got there, there was no money for food whatsoever. So for 21 days, I didn't have any food. Really interesting. And eventually, I manifested it. And after the 21st day, you know, some most dodgy chap in Belize, he's looking around and said, Christopher, you know, I know you've got no money. Look, here's 50 Belize dollars. Don't tell anyone because you didn't want to look weak. And I thanked him so much. And that got me through because 50 Belize dollars is about 15 US dollars. But in Belize, that would last you two weeks, you know, for food. So uh, I learned to manifest by that. So how long did you live in Belize? I, I only went there for like three weeks. You know, I was just there while he was, he was building something. And, uh, you know, and how and old were you at that time? Uh, 45, 45. And so you're 61 now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can do that one easy since I'm 62. <laughs> We're both bad. So, um, all right. So going forward from your birth after learning to deal with the dark forces, what was the take us to something in your life that was strange or unusual that occurred to you at a young age? What was the what's the first thing that comes to your mind when somebody says this after the uh, reptilian thing, the Anunnaki thing that you mentioned? What was the next odd thing that happened to you that you have not yet mentioned? Well, burnt my back when I was four. Um, that was a, a very profound thing because I was in hospital a year, burnt it really badly. And How they did didn't you do, do skin grafts. Uh, pot of tea just came flying from nowhere. It just like went all over my back and I had so a really somebody, big sweat. Somebody, on. something invisible threw it. Yeah. Oh, something yeah. Something that didn't like you. But anyway, because I had a thick sweater on, my mother didn't take it off fast enough. It really burnt my back. So I was in hospital for a year, you know, with that when I was four. Did, did, well, did, I think a human, that, did a human throw it? Did you see a human? It was no, a, no, no, no. It was, it was done. It was done like, you know, uh, off-planet beings. Okay. But I, think, I think the biggest thing that stands out, um, when I was, you know, probably 42, 43, um, I went to India, um, and uh, I was going to see the Dalai Lama. I didn't see him. There's always reasons for that, you know. So, okay, you know, he was with Obama. So, Anyway, so um, I was in uh, Dharamasala and McLeod Ganj, and, you know, I also went to the Punjab region. They had a festival there. It, it's a wonderful time. It really teaches you about how grateful you should be for things because you see people without. And even without, they're willing to share things with you. It was an amazing experience. But anyway, so I went back to the northern camp, the Tibetan northern camp in Delhi, uh, ready to depart, you know, for the flight. 
And one morning they said, uh, you need to change your ticket. I said, why? You need to change your ticket. Why? Just change your ticket. Okay. Didn't tell me why, so I changed the ticket. On the day that uh, the flight was meant to take off, it never left the runway. It went to the end and blew up and killed everyone on board. And I was thinking, wow, you know, that's crazy. So, um, so, so who I, was it? Who was it that told you to change your ticket? Um, the because that beings, you know, uh, talking talking to them. So, which are off off planet beings. When did you first start talking to the these Melchizedek beings? When did you first start that? After I went bankrupt, I realized, and it was really interesting. It was it was a time where you kind of feel sorry for yourself. Look, I've worked for tw- I said, God, look, I've worked for 21 years. I had all this money, and suddenly it's all gone, and this is not okay. You know, and I said, well, it's the right time. What do you mean it's the right time? You know, I'm living out of a, a Volkswagen Polo, uh, and I've got no money for food. And, you know, I didn't realize at the time. I said, yeah, you'll see, it's the right time. By goodness, it was the right time. What a blessing. I look back and would I want to do it again? Uh, absolutely not. But it was such a blessing because it turned my whole life around. I don't care about stuff anymore or anything. I just care about people and I care about close family and I care about, you know, doing service to others. And it changed my life completely. Uh, got away from, you know, I, I don't care about money. I mean, I always have enough. If you work for God, you always have enough. You'll have a multi-billionaire. Who needs that anyway? You know, if you're comfortable and you've got food on the table, by goodness, you, you've got everything, you know. And so, um, yeah, but that, uh, that when, I, when I went bankrupt, I spent a lot of time in meditation. And this is an interesting thing as well that people may want to hear is that your stars, you know. Where, where were you when this, when this happened? Uh, with the context? Where? Where were you? When I went bankrupt, I was in uh, Chester and Manchester, Chester. you know, around Manchester, yeah. Chester's is, 30 miles from Manchester. In UK? Yeah, 20 okay. miles from Liverpool. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. I, I don't mean it. So when I went bankrupt, I was living out of a car and I ended up in Enfield and I was meditating for about four, six hours a day. And it's interesting this because people often think, well, I'm a starseed, I need to know who my starseed family are. And, you know, the, they're all light beings, of course, starseed light beings like Palladians, Arcturians, Lemurians, Atlantarians, uh, Melchizedek, uh, Actorians. So uh, in Belize, I meditated in one of my temples. They're very powerful and it, they showed me my past lives, what I'd done, and I said, you need to be doing this stuff now. So I meditated for six hours a day for quite a long time, about a month, and nothing happened. And in the end, I said, you know what? You're going to contact me, you know, but I knew that they were holding back because they want to see that you're dedicated. They're not going to waste their time with people who are just, oh, I'll meditate for two days or you didn't appear. OK, we're done. They want to see commitment. And anyway, when they connected with me, a strange, amazing things happened and uh, it opened me up completely. And now I've got to, you know, and what's good about off planet beings, you know, uh, light beings is that you can talk to them 24 seven. They're always there. They're always there for you. They're always giving you advice if you ask for it. But uh, to contact them takes a while, and they want to see dedication. You know, and people say, "Well, why? Why do I have to meditate that long?" Well, you're either all in or, or you're not. You know, and um, because they've got so much to do, you know, with starseeds to help them get their power back and get out there and do some great things. You know, with their gifts, whether it's healing, whether it's painting, whether it's singing. You know, everyone's got a different gift. And, you know, my gift is healing. Is my gift reading? No, you know, because I've got dyslexia. I struggle. I mean, I can read, but I'll read a sentence and think, well, that doesn't make sense. And then read it again because you miss words. And, you know, it's not my gift. Writing books is not my gift. How did I write my books? I got a ghostwriter and dictated the stuff. And so I found a solution that, you know, is good for me. Because I tried naturally speaking, good dragon naturally speaking, things like that. You know, I used to say, Oh, Zeta Grays, and it comes up with have a nice day, you know, because it didn't recognize half the words. And so that was a waste of time. So the ghostwriter was really good because she can pull the information out of me. And it's interesting, when I was, um, when I came to the United States, I went to Alaska, someone wanted to sponsor me. And this lady said, you've got to write a book. I thought, oh, you have to be kidding. Yeah, you've got to write a book. I said, okay. And it's interesting because she gave me this pamphlet of a well-known author, I can't remember the name of, and at the first, the first page, I read it, and, I th- and she said something very profound that I'll never forget. She said, 
the information that you have that you take for granted is someone else's wow factor like come to jesus moment oh wow that's incredible because i think you know as you accumulate information you just take it for granted i mean i know this i know that i've done this and this this you know so many different things have happened in my life and um i thought wow you know where do you start with a book and the answer is uh, i got a ghostwriter and they helped me look at chapters and i wrote uh, the divine healing one and i wrote um, uh, one on um uh, center in the mind uh divine transcendence and then we wrote this one you know, we've got the prayer book so you know they've all come i think i've written in about six books but you know i needed help with it because it's not my it's not my gift you know some people can write all day and it's just amazing that's not me you know i'm much better at speaking so what what do you what do you feel got you connected with the melchizedek forces that are helping you first and, and most was it the meditating in belize or was it the meditating in manchester or what was it something else i think the mayan temple helped me because i was sitting on the top and the, the energy the mayans knew how to build temples and uh you know they're very powerful temples and when i was there it was interesting i was just sitting i sat for about four hours watching visions and this that and the other and then when i went back to the hotel room <coughs> they created <coughs> sorry they created like a three definition uh, television type thing where they were showing me it was it was like wow you know um it was like watching a movie you know right in front of your eyes in the room and they showed me past lives they showed me what's happening and and from that i realized what i'm meant to be doing now <coughs> excuse me so why did you go or what drew you to go to that uh, which temple was it, and uh, and what? Tell me how you got to the temple. Well, I went to San Ignacio, where this uh, Knights Templar guy took me, and then I found out about uh, the temple's called Chetantovich. It's just outside San Ignacio, and this, you know, they said, "Do you want to go to the Mayan temple?" I said, "Absolutely." So I went there and I spent a whole day there, and it was interesting because the reason why I've got came to Hollister, which is here where the Ministry Building is is because there's a lady there and she was being attacked by uh, deep state satanic stuff, you know, uh, to do with the Masonic Lodge. And they were really attacking her, threatening her and all sorts of things. So I said, look, let's do a ceremony, let's cancel this. And so I did a ceremony again, bringing me all for guard and different things, broke all the spells and curses off and all the emails just stopped. You go, wow, that was really powerful. And then she said, why don't you come stay uh, in the United States, you know, with me and my father for a week or two? And maybe you can teach some things. And I came here and ended up in Hollister, which is where the ministry building is, this building now, you know, so it's, it's incredible. So, OK, so. You, before you were before you went to the temple that you just talked about, what did you what did you hear and how did you hear it that drew you to did somebody First of all, what country is the temple in? Uh, what, the Mayan temple? It's in Belize. In Belize. Okay, yeah. so and so some guy just come, came to you and said, come to Belize, I'll pay your tri trip to Belize. There's plenty of money there. He was, or uh, worked there or whatever. He was lying to you, but he paid your way there. Is that correct? Correct, and then there's no money. Yeah, and I'd known him for a while because he wanted me to, I, I actually joined his Knights Templar division for a short time. And uh, what happened is I realized that I was being used. They wanted to use your gifts. You know, that's what happens with these things. And uh, they're not for sale. And so I walked away from it after a while. But but he did sponsor me to Belize and also to go to um, India as well. So I'm very grateful for that. And he also showed me what I don't want. And that is to be... Uh, run by somebody. I don't need anyone to run my gifts. My gifts are your gifts, and you know you give them uh, to people. They're not for sale. You know, you know what I mean. So when when you talk to the to the Melchizedek forces that help you, how do you hear them? Do you, does it sound like you're talking to yourself, or do you hear voices that are beyond your own thought patterns? Yeah, beyond your own thought patterns. You know, so 
absolutely. How, it, how does it? How how do you hear them? Or uh, how do how do they sound? Is it is it audio or is it thought only or is it? it uh, it's interesting. It comes from the center brain. It's like it's like it's like a knowing. You know, uh, you can hear. Can you hear the audio? That's an interesting thing. I I think you can, but it comes from the center of the brain. You know, it's coming from in the brain. It's not coming from external ears or anything like that. But you can just hear them. Like yes. Oh, you know, you're saying say, well, that you know, it's coming from your own center. Yeah, absolutely. It's like if I ask them something, look, you know, shall I do this or shall I do that, you know? And they'll say, yeah, buy it or or do this or do that, you know. It's it's a very prominent, um, you can hear it within your mind. It's a bit different than actually audio hearing. But so do you, do you have all the other books that you wrote with you? Yeah, yeah. I've got them here. Um, this is the first one I ever did. Um, this is uh, Dissolving the Enigma of Divine Healing, and that's been out for probably about 10 pull, years. Pull it down a little bit, down, down. Sorry. Okay, uh, yes. D dissolving the Enigma of Divine Healing. Yeah, okay. then we got, uh, uh, ma I did one on manifestation, because people, this is quite a thick book actually, but uh, people, it's, it's about manifestation, and it gives you a technique <clears throat> where, you can manifest from God using a pentagram. And people think pentagrams are dark. They're not. It depends what energy, you know, what symbology you use. If you use angelic symbology, then you're manifesting from God. If you use Luciferian symbology, then you're giving your soul away and you're manifesting from Lucifer. So um, so that explains all that, you know, because I've had so many people. It's interesting, through the journey, I hear so many people, well, love and light, I'm of service, I'm right up there spiritually, but 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 I'm broke. Okay, so you're broke, but you're really up there, which means you're really not, you know, because in my opinion, and I'm living proof of this, I came here 10 years ago with absolutely nothing except two boxes of a couple of things like a few CDs and whatever, nothing else, nothing, absolutely nada. And, you know, I've done a lot of work, I've traveled the States, I've done a lot of meetings and healings and different things. And now, you know, it's got its own momentum where, you know, we get enough healings. There's always enough. You know, I'm not a millionaire, multi-billionaire. I'm not a billionaire. I, I always have enough. You know, you've got food on the table. We've got a ministry building. Thank you very much, God. And, and we've got a house and that's it. You know, who needs anything else? We've got a car. You know, it's just a standard Chevy truck. But you don't need, you know, billion. And it's not about the money per se. It's just about the blessing. I've got Mandy, my wife, and... You know, we've got a great family around us. You know, the gratitude to me, one of the key instruments to success in a spiritual business is a gratitude, which which is also connected to surrender. Like, don't worry about the money. It'll always come as long as you don't manifest your demise. You know, you go, oh, thank you, God, for the blessings. I think the second thing is that people make a mistake with um, spiritual businesses, because it is a business, is that. They do things that they don't like. So they start off, they've got no money, and, oh, well, you know, I've got to try and get my computer fixed because the Zoom's not working, da, da, da. We have an IT guy. He comes in, he fixes all the computers. I pay him $100 an hour. That's fine. We do that. The accountant does all the accounts because I'm terrible at accounts. Don't like counting beans. So she, they do all of it. Every week they check it all out, and, and I pay them, you know, a lot of money per year, like $24,000 a year to do the accounts because I'm no good at it. And that means that it frees you up to do the things you're really good at, which is my gift, which is healing. And so, you know, it's very important. Don't do things that you don't enjoy because why would you do that? I mean, I could spend a day trying to mess with the computer. This guy is on top of it because he knows all the idiosyncrasies about the next update and what's happened. And da, da, da. So he just comes and fixes it straight away. Well, you know, instead of wasting your time on that, just do the healings. And that's what I do. I don't do any of that. Uh, we've got girls in the office. We have about eight staff. Um, girls in the office who take phone calls, who schedule people, who give feedback, you know, they do a whole load of stuff. I just focus on the healings and, and that's important to me. I don't want to muddy my mind with anything else, you know. So your your clientele comes through word of mouth? Yeah, it's all word of mouth. I mean, when you know, you'll find that with a spiritual, you know, entity like this, you know, the ministry is 
what once you've been out there enough and you've been to expos you've done this and believe you me i've been all over the us and you know i think you get a certain then momentum where people tell people tell people tell people and now just people come you know this is what i don't know what happened but you know sometimes you get god intervention where well you you in my browser your website came up from nowhere you know it's a god sign you know so uh it's amazing so um what other things uh, happened in your life that you'd like to mention that uh, are interesting in relation to okay so let's go back a second in your um in your bio you mentioned pleiadians and arcturians so uh what was the very first time you met either of these and uh, how did that play out i've met the arcturians in conjunction with mckillsdeck beings there's only five mckillsdeck beings here of which i was born one and there's actually a number of arcturians arcturians work very closely with mckillsdeck beings and and they told me about um let's just think 15 years ago i was going to do a massive pyramid project i said okay and and I thought, oh, well, we need to get on with it. And of course, the ego kicks in a bit. And I thought, and I realized, well, uh, <laughs> the ego's not working. Let's cancel that. Let's just allow. And and it's going to be in God's timing. So anyway, I've been in touch with uh, the Actorians. And they're building it off planet. Uh, these things are huge. They're made of Moldavite. Uh, they're ancient technology. Uh, one's 999.99 feet tall. The other one's 666.66 feet tall, and the other one's 333. They're going to be on a golden curve, but the biggest one will be on the center of a juncture of the ley lines where it can actually, uh, you know, produce energy and fire into the ley lines to help the vibration of the planet. And I've known this for a long time, but it's now getting closer. And I think it's going to really help this transition as well, you know. But of course, will they bring them down right now with the current state of the world? Probably not. So, I think they'll have to start turning around first before they're going to bring these down. Um, so what about the Palladians? When did you meet them? Uh, I've met some Palladians. Uh, I've seen some Palladian star seeds, uh, quite a few of them. Um, I've seen some actually in Springfield. Uh, but I have met the beings that have actually visited. Sometimes these, vi these beings visit and they're actually... You can see them, you know, their energy form. You can see them as like a, a being, you know. They're very um, fair. They've got very light hair, this sort of thing. You know, it, all the beings are very different. And so, yeah. Or sometimes you meet them in meditation, of course, you know. Um, I mean, when I attend the Galactic Federation, sometimes they take your soul out. Sometimes you're physically there. So if it's close to the planet, they'll take you and you're physically there. Um You'll certainly know about it because next morning you ache all over. You feel as though someone's beating you with a baseball bat. Oh, my God, I can't move because these these craft travel very fast. If they take your soul uh, to, you know, a different dimension or something to have a meeting, then uh, that's very different. You know, then you're just out of it, you know, almost like in a coma until the soul comes back. Very interesting. So... Um... I um, so is there anything that ha has happened in your life that was of a paranormal nature or of a, an ET nature, either one, or anything else that you feel called to mention? Yeah, I was asked to go to a ranch. <clears throat> it's actually Stardust Ranch. Um, the guy since passed away, God bless him, John. But I went to this ranch. It was in Arizona. And what was happening is that uh, he would have, suddenly have portals open. They would have craft coming through, like the greys. And then what would happen is, you know, he had a horse sanctuary on this ranch. Uh, he looked after old horses because he didn't want them put down. And what was happening is that these ETs would go and eat one of the horses. So he'd find one of his horses completely dismembered and half eaten in the morning. And he was really upset about it. He said, can you do something about it? So I went down and... Uh, the portal wasn't open at the time, and so I spent about a day or two figuring out how to code out, the, you know, to open this portal. Figured it out. There's a sonic beam. It was interesting because 
He always described the portal as opening at ground level. And they know what I'm like. So I think as soon as it opened, it was about three or 400 feet in the air. So I couldn't reach it because I'd probably walk through it. And it's probably not a good idea. But, you know, uh, me, I've got no fear about anything. That's the problem. So, so anyway, opens three feet, a craft coming out of it. And then the Actorians arrived. Uh, three craft arrived about a mile away. And that was really interesting. And they sat there. They went. They were going from three to one, you know, going behind each other, three to one. And, you know, I talked to them, telepathy. I said, what are you guys doing here? Well, we're your watchers. I said, okay, so you're keeping an army. Uh, yeah, making sure you don't do stupid stuff, you know. Okay, so anyway, they stayed there. And then about five minutes later, the military helicopters come out and start circling, thinking, well, what do we do with these things? And uh, So anyway, I spent about 40 minutes. I shut this portal down, uh, and it went. The Actorians went, and then the bunch of helicopters, oh, they've gone, okay. And so they, they took off and, and went. That was a quite an interesting thing, and, and the actual horse dismemberment thing stopped from then on. So I was happy about that. What was the fellow who owned the Stardust Ranch, what was his name? Uh, John, um, gosh, John. Have a look at Stardust Ranch. He's, he's, got, a, he's got a website. He's since passed, bless his heart. Uh, last February, but uh, I really miss him. John, I can't remember his second name. Have a, uh, yeah, have a look at the internet. That's okay, that's, that's okay if you don't remember, but you remember yeah, him. Yeah. It, it's, oh, yeah, it's, I remember it's him. You forget people's name, but you never forget, <laughs> you never forget their face. You don't forget the face or their first right. name. You know, John, right. uh, John, John, John. Can't remember his name, yeah. But that's that's in, uh, in Utah, right, Stardust? Utah, no, it's in Arizona. Oh, it's in Arizona. Yeah, it's it's. I don't. I can't remember. I'm probably about 15 miles from Phoenix or 10 miles from Phoenix. Oh, okay. Arizona. I was thinking it was in Utah, but yeah, there's another. There's other ranches. Well, the Skinwalker Ranch is the only one that is really famous. But then there's one that's real close to there that I forget its name, but it's also well, fairly well known in circles of people who know that sort of thing. But uh, um, Stardust is in, near Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether it's still open now because I, I haven't spoken to him for a couple of years. Once we did that, you know, I did him a service, shut it down, and then we were good to go. So, so yeah. So what else would you like to mention that was interesting that's happened to you in your life, if anything? <laughs> There's so much. But <laughs> well, you, you know, people... Uh, People have people like you and me have so many things happen to them that it's like an every you know an everyday occurrence and it's not it doesn't yeah, it doesn't it. strike us as being unusual unless you really think you know you sit and think about it and you spend uh, you know some time remembering because you know the things happen on a daily basis it's like you kind of it's no big deal to you but to the next person it's like huh what. And, you know, like I was um, I was on a movie set a long time ago and I was talking to a guy who was playing a um, he was playing a guard in this movie that I was I did. I was the stunt coordinator on this movie and uh, he um, he met he was from Chile, either Chile or Peru. I think it was Chile. Uh, and he's. I asked him about UFOs, and he said, uh, in Chile, they're so common, they occur almost every day. It's, they're so, so common that people look over and, you know, they show up, people look over and see them, and they don't even pay attention. They just keep on doing whatever they're doing because it's not, it's like an everyday thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I've seen them. I mean, I see them a lot here. You know, I can see through the veil. Even when you don't think they're there, because they can actually, uh, you know, they can cloak themselves in energy where you can't see them. But you know, I, I'm, I have the ability to look through that, look through the veil and see them. So, you know, I see, I see things all the time. You know, um, it's, you know, like I say, you know, it's almost like you get so used to it that you, ah, it's nothing. It's like what I said at the start. You know, it, it, looking, you know, when that lady gave me that folder to look at, you know, here's how to write a book and said. The information you have is someone's like wow factor, and I think it's true because, like you say, you know, you come across so many different things every day, and you know, I've I've, I've seen so many situations 
that uh, you know is just a common occurrence, you know. But uh, but yeah, many things. I mean, we've been checked out by the FBI about two years ago. Um, I just felt agents around because I can feel it within two or three miles. That, oh, there's someone watching us. Anyway, I um, with the pyramid project, we've got a top banker and a top top black ops now come white hat person who's helping us get the money for this pyramid project which is billions of dollars it's way out of my league so i've left them to that but anyway i made a phone call and said um i know the fbi are watching me can you find out why and i said anyway he made a few phone calls came back and said yeah they just want to check you're not a cult of any type i said, well, uh no <laughs> so anyway they spent a few and he said look i'll phone them back in 14 days and I know they checked us out and, you know, whatever they did, and um, they, they were fine. But, uh, well, you know, we have been checked out by people. They're because of, fine. they I worked for them for a year or two. Uh, and uh, in the I, I worked in the J. Edgar Hoover building in downtown D.C. And, um, they Yeah, they're, they're, they were a big customer of mine. So I, I know all about the FBI. So... Um, Get into other things that you've been, um, how do I put this? You talk about a lot of different subjects, or rather, uh, in your, in what your publicist sent me, you talk, uh, you mentioned, what's mentioned in there is a lot of things about uh, negative um, government or negative forces on the earth and we've already talked about the non-corporeal ones what about the ones that walk on the earth like you and me what do you know about those uh, forces the directly you know that you've that uh what have you seen with your own two eyes that is dark that is more of a physical nature if anything that comes to mind well there's a few things i mean first of all um the shapeshifters, uh, we know that. The Queen of England was a shapeshifter. She was an anarchy who took human form. She's passed away and uh, was very upset. Uh, not really, bless her heart, but, you know, she's gone. Well, she's very satanic, in my opinion. You know, uh, other people think differently. That's okay, you know. But uh, I've come across people. I dated a reptilian person. Didn't realise she was a reptilian. Never thought about it, you know. And I was, she was mean all the time why are you so mean one night i was sitting on the sofa and i looked at her and there's we have a map of intent to uh discover who these people are so you ground yourself say dear i am of god i ground myself to the earth dear god i command you show me this person in their true form if they're reptilian you'll get you get an overlay of like an opaque reptilian outline because they can't hide from you on this app i'm like oh my god i've been <laughs> i've been dating a reptilian so next morning I was gone. I just put on myself stuff in bin bags, poof, gone, uh, because I didn't realise she was reptilian. But now I check everybody and everything. Um, so the overlay that you just mentioned that you saw, um, okay, so I've seen things that were, um, I knew at the time I saw them that they were in my mind. So I, uh, uh, how do I put this? I saw them with my eyes, but they, I knew that they were, I was seeing them psychically and if there was a person standing next to me, he might not have seen it at all. Uh, and in my case, the, the thing that is coming to my mind at the moment uh, that would not have been seen by another person was uh, probably a gin. And yeah, which least, is on an all. Yeah, yeah. Well, I said gin. I mean, like the like the Muslims talk about. Yeah. Um, it, what I saw, look, you know how um, people used to think about uh, genies before I Dream of Genie, before the TV show, the uh, people uh, saw or believed genies looked like men who were uh, overly muscular and big with a turban. Yeah. You know that you know that kind of that's right yeah yeah that's the kind of narrative they've created yeah that's actually what i saw and uh it looked like something that was a human bodybuilder that was larger than normal 
it only saw it psychically. It was there just for a second, barely there, but very there, enough to scare me enough where I almost fell down and uh, came at me and then disappeared. But uh, I assume it was a gin, and I know nothing about gins. Do you know anything about gins by any chance? Well, yeah, I mean, they exist uh, uh, in the fifth dimension. They they do help people manifest. I mean, it's part of the fable as well. They're, they're around. I mean, on the, on the land we have at 20 minutes away, we've actually been down there because we have some cabins whilst a house is being built. And we've seen a fairy, like, you know, a green fairy literally just, you know, people think, oh, God, you're nuts. I'm not because I saw it with my own eyes. It just flew and then took off down one of the pathways and disappeared, you know, and that's happened a couple of times. So, you know, these things exist in different dimensions. But So are you familiar with uh, the Apuni? Uh, uh, Apu- uh, uh, what's their name? Um, are you familiar with the UFO uh, group that are um, they're all almost all of them are Spanish speaking only there's like one I interviewed one of them who speaks English but he's the only member of their group living in North America that speaks English and I interviewed him as one of my 67 people I've interviewed and um, Grant Cameron the UFO investigator um, the very first time I heard about it, he had a video. It was like the second or third video he put out. He actually went to one of their events and filmed or recorded, video recorded, a um, um, what they call, it's a, they don't call it a, it is a portal, but they call it something else. I forgot what they, the word they used to call it, but it's, it's um, it's a uh, in the shape of like a um, like a um, like a rainbow uh, yeah. shape, you know, the half circle, but stretched yeah. out, stretched out more. And the one he filmed uh, or videotaped was out over the water, and it was extremely obvious. It looked like a cl- a perfectly shaped cloud in the shape of an arc over the water. And um, it's a portal. And these aliens, uh, when it manifests over the land, the the craft or the beings come through this portal. And, um, and when they come, they uh, have, it's not just the beings, but it's also they have fairies with them. Yeah. So oh, yeah. you have a uh, an ET of some kind, supposedly, and you have a fairy with the, I assume, pointed ears, but I really don't know what a fairy looks like because I've never seen one uh, personally. Well, I mean, some of them are small. I mean, I think you can get larger fairies. I've only seen the very small ones, but um, these, these ones that we've got down there are actually green in color, bright green, beautiful. You know, it's amazing. Well, I don't think the ones that the aliens come with are tiny. I think they're like probably you know, bigger, yeah. Probably three or four foot tall, I would guess. Just just guessing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it could be a little bit shorter than that, but I really don't know since I've never seen one. And I've never heard anybody describe the fairy that sh- the the ETs that they're manifesting the a pony. Oh God, I forget what, what I, I call it a pony, but it. I know that is Apunia, yeah, Apunia uh, is the name of the uh, ETs, and I, you know, I haven't heard any description that's really very good of the aliens, the Apunia, or the fairies, either one, and, uh, but I just thought you might have some information in that area, but um, I think we've covered everything, but I want to I want you to talk about anything in depth that you feel called to talk about that is that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, and I'm not going to direct you, but I I know that uh, I've just said uh, I wanted you to speak about the physical. Um, you mentioned uh, shape shifting uh, when I asked you 
you, um, back up a little bit. What was that you mentioned about shapeshifter or something? What was that exactly? Yeah, there's 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 a number of. I mean, on this planet, so I've I've listened to this. It's very interesting. So I've done some research about. Okay, I'll have a look in uh, 1800s. In the 1800, there was 136 million people on the planet. Okay, so. So if we if we look at you know and this I'm just giving people an idea because so so if everyone has 2.2 children some people don't some people do you know whatever so so that's going to that's going to maybe you know if 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 you half it 136 million you've got like uh, 70 million say of people on the planet uh, sorry 70 million couples of which if they had 2.2 children that would be 140 million kids in 80 years and of course the parents die off so you could lose them or that couple and then you know um then the kids are gonna have kids of their own and the kids you know so if you look at every cycle for 70 or 80 years um in 1900 i think there was 2.1 billion and you're kind of thinking on an ergonomic growth, there's no way with 136 million you can get to 2.1 billion in 100 years. Just can't do it. So what's going on? And the answer is there's a lot of NC, what they call NCPs, non, sorry, NPCs, non-player characters, which have been grown in a, a pod. They have no soul because from my perspective, uh, if you want to attach a soul to a fetus, you need a womb, you know, full stop. Uh, you can't do it, I don't think, in plastic things, because this is a God thing, the soul's a God thing. So if they're produced in pods, they've got some sort of AI fake, you know, energy with them. Uh, but you can also, you can also, you can all always see uh, a non-character player because they're kind of checked out, they're not really with it. And there's a lot of them, probably about, I would say, 60, 65% of the planet are you know born out of pods or something else so there's the you know people think it's all human beings on this planet it's really not so you know don't be surprised there's a lot of reptilians here there's a lot of reptilian hybrids because one of the things that's important to know about this planet is the reptilians are below you know the anunnaki draconians they live below so do the luciferians they don't breathe much oxygen they're very satanic and what they want to do is they want to get up on the surface and so there's a big battle for this planet going on. Uh, and people think, oh, it's the deep states, the governments, da, da, da. They're just puppets. They're honestly just puppets. They're controlled by these reptilians who are very powerful down below the planet. So one of the things is that, you know, to really help this planet, we probably need to um, reduce the population of the reptilians or get them to leave the planet. How do we do that? Well, if you raise the vibration, they're low vibrational beings. If you raise this planet's vibration uh, suddenly, you know, to a really whole new level, they wouldn't be able to stay there because they can't stay in a high vibrational place. They would have to leave. So that would give us the facility to, you know, cleanse the planet of reptilian beings. And that's one of the things that the pyramids will do. They'll really help raise the vibration of the planet. I just don't want people to think, oh, it's all the government, it's, you know, different uh you know different prime ministers and presidents are the, you know they're, they're just puppets for uh, a race down below that's really in charge of this planet so you know it's not just taking the governments out uh, if you want to correct things like in the us uh you've got to actually correct the satanic beings that are in control of these people and uh you know so it's just just an important point i think so at the top of the food chain, is it corporeal or non-corporeal? Top of the food chain is uh, the down side. here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, is, period. Um, period. Overall. Overall is uh, the draconians. They're in charge of it. But they're working with the Anunnaki, the, you know. So the corporeal. Archons. You're saying corporeal yeah. is, mm -hmm. is the highest high part of the food. Okay, so uh, the... Remote viewers and um, uh, the lady, oh God, Linda Moulton Howe, and the remote viewers she talks to, and there's a rumor floating around that that uh, 
that there's three factions, loosely connected factions. Uh, some ETs that love us, some people, some ETs that want to eat it or kill us, and some ETs that don't really care one way or the other what happens to us because they feel like, you know, it's a growing thing regardless of which way we go. So that's one scenario. Then uh, other people I talk to say they're on craft and everybody's equal. And then I have other people I talk to say the greys are the ones that, that are uh, the most powerful. And, you know, you get a lot of different people saying a lot of different things about as far as the overall um, setup of what's going on. And I like some people say that the, um, uh, the, the Orion Wars are still occurring. You know? Oh, yeah. And so what is your idea of the overall uh, makeup of the picture with all different types of ETs and, and you know, the whole universe, all of it, what, what do you, um, especially in, specifically around the Earth, you know, because with all the different galaxies, trillions of galaxies and trillions of races, you really can't wrap your mind around all of it because there's so many different pieces. But oh, yeah. what, what I what people want to hear about really is your direct knowledge of or what you believe based on your direct knowledge of what is going on around the Earth itself. So which of these scenarios, if any of them, do you buy into and why? Well, the greys, I mean, yeah, I think they're very powerful. I think they were more in control at one time. They're not now because they've been wiped off the planet. They have to come through portals. They also have to, you've got to remember also that there's certain universal laws that they cannot break. They cannot go against. So they were told that you can't be in this time space. So they're coming through portals. They're cheating, but they're not as powerful as they were. Um, I really believe that, you know, uh, the uh, draconians that are on planet X or Nabu, it's getting closer and closer and they want to try and, you know, they want to try and get it. I mean, there's, there's always a fight with these beings like Anunnaki, Draconians, everything else. Luciferians, they're very powerful beings as well. I mean, they've managed to control Vatican and all the Catholic churches and things like this uh, with their rituals and everything else. So, you know, are they powerful? Well, yeah, it's happening, you know. So, but I, th I think they're working together because they want to, tr and I think they'll probably share the planet if they're trying, you know. I mean, Anunnaki eat you, you know, they'll, they'll eat your bones, everything. They're big beings. So well, do draconians. You, so you, do mentioned the, you mentioned that you were connected with the Galactic Federation earlier. Okay, so um, when did you first get connected with the Galactic Federation? What do you know about them? How do you connect with them? How often do you see them? What What is your experience? Go through uh, as quickly as you can or as slow as you want and as detailed as you like. Anything regarding your connection to the Galactic Federation, which you've already mentioned? Well, you know, it's one of my jobs here to police time space, which means that if people make, um, for example, Tesla lights, have you ever seen Tesla lights? They're high, high voltage tubes and you're supposed to lie between them and people think they're good. Uh, they're not. They open 7 million portals an hour. So you can imagine we live in a, a, sp a space-time continuum here, uh, which is like a football. So if the planet's inside the football, if you put loads of holes in this in this um, football, what's going to happen is the air's going to change inside. So the space-time continuum would change, and you wouldn't be able to live in that vibration. So you know it's our job to please and close portals if it gets too much, where we can have the time-space continuum down here uh, balanced. So that's one of my jobs. I work with the Arcturians. There's another job is that there's a crystalline structure around the planet. You know, it's a crystalline structure. Uh, it's in the atmosphere where you can, uh, emotion bleeds into it, but you can also use it for telepathy. And of course, what's happened, people have lost the telepathy ability, but the amount of emotion coming out of people now is so profound that the collective builds up in this crystalline structure 
And then the Arcturians have to clear it out. Uh, we used to clear out every three or four months, like maybe twice a year, three times a year. Now we're clearing it out every week and that's not enough. But but there's also an element that people, when you feel a collective, you know, and I'm sure people are home thinking, wow, you know, the collective energy is really strong. I feel like I've got a brick in my chest. Well, again, a map of intent, you can remove it and send it back to God. You don't need to hold on to that. But, you know, it's being aware that you're feeling this anxiety. It's not you. It's coming from the collective. You, you've got to, it's very important to understand where all these things are coming from. So the Galactic Federation do police space and time. They make sure that people are breaking the rules. If they do break the rules, they can actually interfere. But the whole point about it, of course, if you're a starseed, why, why have they sent starseeds here? quite fundamentally because the planet is all about free will and so they can't just come in unless someone says hey guys we need some help uh, and then they can come in because they're authorized to come down here but but they can't if people don't ask for help and that's the key about you know maps of intent so you know i think it's just an important point it's a free will planet can't interfere unless we're asked so what they've done is place starties down here at this time so they can pull from the youth as the beings on the help they need to help shift the planet and there's about 400,000 star seeds here. So how do you, how do you connect with the Galactic Federation? Through the Arcturians and the Pleiadians or in Well, some... through the because that beings, you know, the, I mean, I'm one of three that chair this Galactic Federation and sometimes I'm not there, sometimes I'm there. I was there at the um, at the Greys and, you know, I mean, you can't tell how long you're there because and they took my soul that time because it was weird because I said you know yeah we need you right now and what happens when your soul goes traveling of course you collapse on the floor and normally they give you like five ten minutes look we're going to take you in five ten minutes lie on the bed and you'll be okay but this time they wanted us straight away and so I was collapsed on the floor my wife was like, oh shit he's he's passed out or he's had a stroke oh no hang on a minute and they, she just oh he's at the Galactic Federation that's okay so I was just on the floor you know uh, because when your soul's left, you know, you're in like comatose state until your soul comes back. Ten minutes later, I was back. I uh, don't know how long I spent there, of course, because there's no time there. But there was a discussion with many, many different types of beings. Uh, and, you know, it's always all agreed with all the factions of beings there, of which there was over a thousand, to agree to, yeah, let's do some activity because you can't just govern it. And that's the thing when people say, oh, I'm in charge. You know, I've heard people say, oh, yeah, I'm the... I'm the governor of planet Earth. Uh, that would never happen because you need enough beings so that you can get a fair judgment, you know, and everyone agrees that, yeah, the greys need to be taken off the planet because they're violating the human race. So when you were gone, how long did you say you were gone? That time? Uh, our time here, 10 minutes. But there, okay, so it, felt, it felt like... Do you, do you remember... A the day or two. Do you remember when you were there during that 10 minute period? Do you remember the uh, experiences you had while you were there? Do you remember those? Yeah, I mean, everyone talks in telepathy. It's really interesting. So, you know, they're talking to you in telepathy and uh, the discussion was, you know, there's many factions of beings there and the discussion was just like, okay, who believes, you know, that the greys have violated the human race? It's not, a, it's not an education of direct violation. Yeah. And everyone agreed. I said, OK, you know, who's going to take them off the planet? And the Arcturians volunteered and and they went in uh, two days later. They were taken off the planet and uh, banned from coming back in this time space. The mistake we made is that we should have said and through all space time continuum on planet Earth in every dimension. But we didn't. We just said in this time space. So what they're doing is to get around that they're coming through portals. So they're in a different time space, you know, in a portal. You see what I mean? Well, when you were there and you were speaking with all the beings at this event, can you describe your surroundings during that uh, day? It was um, it was actually on top of a mountainous area, and the it was kind of outside, you know. Um, where was it? I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure, but it certainly wasn't on this planet. So you had a meeting with hundreds or thousands of... About, yeah, there was a lot. You know, it was like, I would say 
probably about a football field and a half of being. So how many were there? I don't know. But but it looked like a thousand, two thousand. What because there's many factions who get. And were any of the beings identical to each other? You know, there was yeah, like yeah. five of these yeah, and there's... ten of those. And... Yeah, ten of those. And, you know, yeah, there's different factions and who would come, you know, with their leaders and everything else to uh, discuss because, and it, you know, I don't remember all the discussion, but it was, it, it went on for, I don't know how much time, who knows, because there's no time there. It just happens. So, so when, when, you, when you were at this event, you were outside of normal space time. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah, because it was all telepathy. You could talk to each being, you know, even if they were at the back of the football field. I mean, it was a huge area on top of this mountain uh, at the time. So, I've been so, in other areas where it's been like, um, well, I've been on craft for a start, you know. Um, can you, other, every area is different. Can you... Uh, Go through some of your onboard experiences. Yeah, I mean, there's. It's interesting because when you go on these craft, you know, you look at them and they look pretty. You know, they look pretty small. How the heck do you have all these people on a craft? Well, when you go inside them, it, it expands. You know, the time space and the space expands like a thousandfold. So they're huge ships, but they they look small. So when you enter them, you know, you can walk for miles. You know, it's, it's well, not miles, but a long way you know the the craft actually work on thought there's no you know steering or throttle they just use the mind you know so uh it's incredible and so it's like that. it's like doctor who uh, it is yeah they don't have any throttles or nonsense and you know these craft go really fast but you know what um, i'm saying it's bigger on the inside than the outside oh yeah yeah Hard that, that little yeah, that what was it called? Yeah, that police, the police thing. When you right. walk into it, it's huge. You know, it's the same. It's actually the same with craft. And of course, they've got you know light, uh, you know, uh, vision things. You know, I mean, everything's different. And of course, it's it's beyond way beyond our technology. I've not seen it before, but it was really interesting. How many times have you been on craft that you remember? Uh, Relatively speaking, probably about. Maybe six, five or six. Can you go through all six experiences? Uh, I would have to think about it because they they were all different. I mean, I remember that one time. Uh, uh, give, give us give us at least one experience where you're on the craft in de- in some detail and a little bit more detail, if you can. Um. I said about the crowd. I'm trying to think why they took me the I think it was something to do with the I think it was something to do with the bioweapon. I was actually dusted. That's why I got a little bump here because it was really big. Yeah, I'm reducing it. But I was dusted with a bioweapon and um I went on the craft and they wanted to heal me, so you know, they just get uh, me to lie down. Hold on, stop. Back up. <laughs> Back up, you were dusted. Tell us about you're getting dusted with a bioweapon before they took you on the crew. Tell us about you, we when I when I speak to people and I interview them, they gloss over all these interesting events <laughs> as if they're no big deal, but they're a big deal. So back up and tell us about your dusting so, with the bioweapon. It was approximately seven years ago. It was in the um, uh, the Hilton, Los Angeles. I went to the expo there. The Conscious Life Expo, and um, to them, yeah, and I was meant to speak. Anyway, what happened is that I remember walking past, and the thing is about me, I'm very self-aware with my body. I feel everything and anything. So I walked, and I thought, hang on a minute, and I felt a light dusting of something, and I looked and couldn't see anything. But when they dust it, it's like so fine, it's nanotechnology. So they dusted me and. I thought, uh, what was that, you know? And because they were, uh, that was a bioweapon, you better get back to your room. So I went back to the room and I got really sick. My temperature went way up. Uh, I was coughing, uh, I was really struggling and, uh, and you know, red. Anyway, I te- kept taking, I kept working on myself. I was giving myself space time continuum energy, which actually starts to fry the bioweapon. So I worked on it. I started feeling better after a while. Hold on, stop, but, stop, stop, back up. You just mentioned that you did what to heal it? Tell us the 
Give us some details about what you did to heal it. Get be be as specific and as detailed as you can about what you were doing to heal yourself. We want to hear that. Well, I put, I put myself in a portal, and I've got this particular energy. There's a couple of types of energy we use. Ultimate dimension energy, which is like you get floaty and it raises your vibration. I also use what I call space-time continuum energy or tachyon energy. It's very different. It's an electrostatic energy. What it does is it breaks down the molecular structure of things like nanotech and pathogens and stealth pathogens like Brillium, Lyme, HIV, AIDS. And so I applied that to my body and really accelerated it. And the because that being showed up and really helped. And we got it, the temperature down after about half a day. But I was really sick, you know, and I thought, I'm, I'm not going to make it unless I do something really, really strong. Did you take your so, temperature? Did you get a temperature reading by any chance? No, it was just absolutely blazing hot. You know, okay. I could feel like it's way, way above. So it felt like a bioweapon. All so, right, go ahead. So what happened is that I start the tacking engine. After about four to six hours, I start feeling better. Not great, but better. And I was uh, better enough to speak. S- stop for a second. Okay. Tell us, um, give us some details about how you do the tachyon energy, that 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 uh, technique or that manifestation. How do you do it? Well, well, basically what I do is open a portal because uh, I work with the because that beings there in the ultimate dimension. So I open a portal from the ultimate dimension, and then basically apply the tachyon energy to the body, and it starts to break down the the bacteria. Or I find out what it was actually uh, because I did a test when I came home. Um, I did a patch test and they looked inside the cells and they found three major things. One was two malaria, which is used by the MI6 in England, which is interesting. Uh, it comes from rats and it's very deadly. Uh, I malaria? Found fine. No, it's, it's called two malaria. Uh, how do you spell it? Don't ask me how to spell it. <laughs> That's not my... Two, two malaria. malaria. T-U-M... A L two malaria. I got it. I got it. Have a look. If you look on Google, you'll find that you know uh, MI6 uh, are the biggest users of that. You know for bioweapon. So you've got two malaria. You've got a binding agent, which binds it to the cells, and you've got a solvent which is banned after 1960 because it's too good going through the skin. So they stopped using it in in paints and that. This binding agent. And, you know, they did a test to say you got massive high levels of this two malaria and the other thing. So, uh, but what happened, my body's very adaptive. It's a little bit different. So what so it who, did is who, who, it who did, a, who did a test on you? Uh, a world-leading toxicologist. Okay. Can you, are you okay with naming him? Yeah, yeah. She's actually retired now because she's been working with Morgellons and What's her name? Dr. Hildy Stanager. Uh, H-I-L-D-E. Yeah, Hildy, Hildegard, and then Staninger. Staninger, uh, S-T-A-N-I-N-G-E-R? I think so, yeah. And she's in which country? Which country? Uh, she's in the U.S. She was actually in Los Angeles. Uh, she had a lab there, and she just did work for people who had been hit by a bioweapon. But she's just recently retired because they've just gone after her, they've bankrupted her, and you know, uh, terrible. So she's so actually she's decided to person. get out of it. She's a good person oh, yeah. that has been uh, treated poorly. Oh, yeah, they've tried to poison her. She's actually had to test, you know, letters and everything for anthrax, and she's had, she's had stuff sent, you know. Okay, uh, so so they, they, they um, hit you with the bioweapon, and yep. you... Uh, Tell us about the ultimate dimension. You just mentioned it. Yeah, the ultimate dimension is ever, forever expanding. It's a very high dimension. There's infinite dimensions. People say, oh, there's only seven or nine. No, there's, there's just infinite in different dimensions. The McKeel's that being sit at the ultimate dimension. And have you been to the ultimate dimension? Uh, I haven't. But the McKeel's but you that know where it's, you, know, you know how to reach it. Oh, yeah, yeah, if I wanted to, but I haven't because, you know, down here doing saying, stuff. <laughs> okay, so when you when you say you reach to them, to the ultimate dimension, what um, what exactly do you do to reach them in the ultimate dimension? What, How do you, 
how do you open up yourself to reach that level? What what do you focus on? What exactly do you do? It's ba it's basically uh, I think about surrendering. You know, people have often asked me, well, you know, yeah, I want to meditate, but what meditations I use? I said uh, nothing. You clear the mind. You clear your mind, and you have to train yourself for this because I know people find it hard. But you clear your mind, and then once you've cleared your mind, you're thinking about nothing. You're connected with them, and then they can take you places. I mean, I've not been to the ultimate dimension, but I've been to other places. Uh, but, um, yeah, but, you know, you can connect with them because you've got a direct connection. So you can't uh, – the do you um, – when you focus on getting to that – to reach out to them in the ultimate dimension, do you focus above you? in your own center how do you focus what do you focus your attention on to reach the ultimate dimension to reach out to the Mel Melchizedek to get their help I, I just focus on them you know because I know them you know Mother Mary's a Melchizedek being she works with us closely because and I just focus on them and uh, at the ultimate dimension contacting them and then one of them will step forward and start talking to you you know because okay, so they can connect with you Okay, so you got doused with the bioweapon. Uh, you assume it's MI6, but you're not sure, I uh, assume. You, well, it could be CIA. I mean, they've all got the same stuff. You right, know, so. So, so you went to Hilde Staninger, Hildegard Staninger, and she gave you the information that you had these three different things in you? Yeah, yeah. She could pick out all three of them, right? Oh, yeah, really high levels. The binding agent, the solvent. Because solvents, you know, if you just spray, you know, if you mix them all together, a solvent just delivers it through the skin. The nanotechnology um, and the um, the bacterial element to malaria uh, with the binding agent would bind it to the cells. And that means it, it's going to be much better acting than, and that's why it was a bioweapon. Do you still have a copy of her results that she gave you? I do actually, yeah. Not here, but I can I can send them. If you scan, I really appreciate if you scan that uh, into. Do you have a scanner? Or oh a yeah, I've got a scanner. Yeah, yeah. If you scan them into a te uh, into a digital format and attach it to an email and send it to me at charles.beaver at comcast.net, that would be very nice. Uh, I will put them below this episode. Uh, because it's good to give, it's good to people. It's good to give proof. Yeah. Well, because, oh, yeah. How do you know it's a bioweapon? Well, people, if you just had a bacterial thing, it's okay. But if you've got a bacterial, if you've got a solvent to deliver it and you've got a binding agent to bind to the cells, which makes it 50 times worse, then you know it's a bioweapon. And she said, this is typical bioweapon stuff. You know? Well, people. So, yeah, I'll people, dig that out, Charles. People. Um, vacillate between thinking you're crazy and thinking you're making it all up. And I don't mean you specifically. I mean, anybody who talks about uh, the paranormal and aliens and oh, yeah. all that stuff, they, they, you know, they, they kind of have these, this two faced mindset. you you know, you're making it up or you're crazy or both, you know, and any kind of proof is better than no proof. So uh, what go, go forward with your story you got doused with the bioweapon. You opened up to the Melchizedek beings on the in the ultimate dimension. Then you you said you went on a ship after that. Yes, because that's what yeah. I was. At. Okay, yeah, yeah. So tell they're, us about the ship part, ship part. Well, that 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 thing. I just arrived, and of course, it's huge. And then they just uh, said, you know, they they basically wanted to knock us out and put us in some sort of thing. That would help uh, take out the toxicity, and it really did help. It didn't take it all out though, which is interesting. And I actually don't know why, because next minute I woke up back on the bed. But they, they actually physically took us. So, have you ever been uh, hypnotized? Um, people have tried, but I've never been able. They've never been able to do it. They've tried. Yes. So, do you understand that hypnosis is self-induced? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if somebody's trying to hypnotize you and they're failing, that means you're failing. It's not them because all they're mm -hmm. doing is trying to get you to play along and you either play along or you don't play along. 
And if you don't play along, then nothing happens. But there are people who can, uh, um, oh, what was his name? Uh, do you know who Wolf Messing is? I've heard of him, yeah. Okay, well, he was uh, a Russian stage hypnotist who lived in the days of Stalin. And when I say in the days of Stalin, I don't mean the days when Stalin ruled Russia. I mean the days before people knew who Stalin was. He was famous, but only within a small circle. He was the he was the governor of um, of Moscow at the time. And he heard a rumor that Wolf Messing could do what he did. And then uh, so he gave him a test and I won't go through all that because it's not really totally relevant. But he could in the in the test, they put him in jail. Right. And the jail is right across the street from uh, the office of where um, Stalin, um, he was the head of like the the, uh, the organization, the secret police long before the KGB were ever invented. He was the head of the secret police and he was the governor of, of, uh, of Moscow. And he, he had uh, Wolf Messing put in jail and in the jail at that time, they left the jail cell doors open and there, a guard would sit outside the jail cell door with a club. And if you got, if you walked past that opening, he would beat the, you know, what out of you until you either died or got thrown back in the cell. And yeah. basically, you know, some, somebody's watching you 24 seven. So he put in the mind of the guy sitting there watching him, uh, you need to get up and use the restroom. So the guy got up and went and used the restroom and he walked out of the cell and then he went to the front door to walk out of the facility and he walked in front of the guy sitting at the desk at the front uh at the front desk that what you know watches people go in or out of the building and when he did that he manifested in the mind uh, mind of the fellow sitting there as uh as stalin and so so the guy stands up and salutes you know because he thinks he's stalin right Oh, yeah. I mean, our walks, minds are very powerful. Absolutely. And he walks right out, you know, out, outside the front door, walks across the street, goes in the building where Stalin's at and says, uh, I passed your test. And, you know, that's the story uh, that I heard. That's I don't know if that's a <laughs> true story, but that's the story that was told. But the point is that some people can uh, control your mind through hypnosis, but in general, 99% of the time it's self-induced and mm -hmm. uh, I learned it a long time ago and we want we're not going to go there because I'd rather hear your stuff so when you're on the ship after you got doused with the weapon how what is there any part of that onboard time that you remember not a lot well, I remember getting there and then I think what happened is that um they knocked us out and then I just ended up back in bed again. I'm like, oh, okay. So I remember kind of going there, but but I think it was more of a, a healing thing rather than a discussion or anything else. So, so is there any but, uh, is there any uh, onboard experience you've had where you have some more details? Um, I'd have to think about them. I mean, I've been through a few. I'm just trying to think. Um, Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to go soon. <laughs> um, it might be better to do it in another podcast. Actually, let me hey, let me think done, about that. We've done because... an hour and forty four minutes, and that's fine. We can do another one uh, if you're willing. And yeah, yeah of course so, I am. You know, I'd like to think about it because sometimes these things. I don't know about you, Charles, but uh, you know, it's weird. Over the last like since 2019, times time's kind of just disappeared and it's just weird like this year you know everyone said wow it just disappeared like that you know and i lose track of when it happened and it's like you know i was thinking about the grays when we had that meeting and i i think it was 2017 uh maybe 18 but i think it was 2017 i think it was just after the when i uh got citizenship which is 2017 um may the 18th so well so what I suggest is probably happening is that you're, you're, 
you're falling more and more in alignment with your higher self and the things you're supposed to be uh, manifesting on earth and things are flowing and oh yeah you know, you know how uh, when you're uh, what in each day you have if you're very busy on that day the day just flies by okay if you're if there's nothing for you to do that day then time crawls so what's my belief is that you're in alignment with your purpose and through that alignment things are just flowing along so quickly for you one minute to the next or one day to the next that you really don't need to to really how do i put this you're doing all the healings you're supposed to be doing you're uh you're doing the things you you were meant to do and so things are flowing by you so quickly that the time is just it's just flying by you Absolutely. And I, I love what I do. I know you can tell, but I love it. I love seeing the change in people from depression to suddenly, oh my God, I feel amazing. That gives me so much joy to see people shift like that. You know, it's amazing. But you, you're right. I think, you know, you lose track of time because, you know, the healing is not really just a, it's not a job at all. It's kind of a way of life. A ministry is a way of life because, you know, you're always on your game. I mean, um, yeah. I agree with you. I think when you're in divine alignment, time does go quickly because there's really no time, you know. So what, I mean, sadly, I have to stick to a schedule, but of course, you know. Um, is there but, anything you'd like to say? Like, for instance, what, uh, tell the people, first of all, the names of your websites, just so we get it out verbally. Yeah, yeah. So the name of the website is uh, www globalenlightenmentproject.com uh, which is a project of the ministry and the ministry it's all one thing really but and the name of the ministry is Christopher Backland Ministries um, if you go to dot com you'll go to global enlightenment project but we decided to call it that because um, that's what we're doing you know we're trying to enlighten the planet trying to help people you know get back to their sovereign selves so like I say if anyone wants help you know we have one to one specialized groups where you know we have like up to 20 people. We talk to them and do the healing after. And then we have two times a week, uh, 5 p.m. Central Time, and tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Central Time every week. On Saturday, we have a, a general healing where we cover most topics. And that's by donation. So if you have no money, please come on. It's okay. You know, I always encourage, because I've been there, got the T-shirt. When you have no money, you have no money. And, you know, you can't afford healings and things like that. That's why I always facilitate people everyone gets a healing you know it's just important to me so uh all the the date the, when you do these things they're all on your website yeah everything's on the website and we also have an solstice sharing you know um like a, just a community um glass of wine thing on the 21st so anyone wants to join feel free it's on the website you have to sign up for it but it's for free you know it's not uh there's no donation it's just a uh, to thank everyone for the year and toast everyone happy holidays and things like this on the solstice so all your rates are on your website what you charge yeah everything's on the website okay is there anything else you want to tell the people before we end this yeah i, I just encourage people i know people having a hard time because i'm seeing it you know this this healing work has never been tougher because people are really struggling you know to keep their vibration up to and, you know, my my opinion is, look, you know, if you're a starseed person, you don't fit into the normal human way of thinking. And I think you're hypersensitive, which means you're an empath. And, you know, don't ever shame yourself. You don't have to fit in with people. I mean, most people who are starseed people end up with very few friends because they're lucky and think you're absolutely nuts. And so, which is okay. So don't ever fit in. Just get the few friends you do have and just enjoy the time with them that hold the space for you, that don't berate you, and set boundaries for people who do. You know, my father, all my life, has berated me. You know, uh, even when I got a degree, you're too thick to get a degree, and so I went and got one. Too thick to get a master's. Got one of those as well. And he berated me because I had dyslexia, but I was brilliant at maths, but not good at English at all. Still not, really. But, and so, so, you know, it's... It's important to set good, healthy boundaries. Don't allow people to drag you down. Uh, very important, I think. So 
one question I forgot to ask you that I have to ask you before I let you go uh, this time. So what, uh, <laughs> what, how many, how big a percentage of the human race on the earth now do you think, you know, of all the real people, not the non, non, you know, those things that are not real, but of all the real people that are on earth, how big a percentage of them do you think have attachings, attachments to them? So how many, how big a percentage of the human race of attachments do you think? Uh, I'm asking them, I'm getting about 86%. You know, most people don't realize they have an attachment. And the other thing they do as well, which is interesting, is they tap in the lower back and damage the old four or five discs. That's why, you know, look at the spine. It's such a strong instrument. And yet everyone's got lower back issues. Why is that? Because these things are tapping in there. And over a period of time, even though it's an energetic being, it damages the disc and it gets bulgy and then, you know, you get sciatic nerve problems and all these sort of things. So, yeah, about 85, 86% of human beings have an attachment. Well, uh, I, ha I have two. Uh, I have an imp that sits on my head and I have another demon that sits on my back. I've had them all my life. So, in any case, it was a pleasure speaking with you. And uh, I hope you come on again. And yeah, absolutely, Charles. I, mean, I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I, you know, enjoyed it. I, I did the best I could to draw out the inst interesting parts of yourself. And if you, uh, if you have a desire to be on again, um, think about uh, all these onboard experiences, all the ET experiences, yeah, we'll all the paranormal experience, everything that you've uh, had over your life, try to recall these things so that um, when I ask you about anything, you'll have lots of juicy details to... <laughs> Examples. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny, though, because you do, you know, it goes into a blur because, you know, you've seen that many things, like you said, and done that many things. You think, wow, you know. Uh, you know, some of them obviously stand out very well, but um, yeah, I'll do that. Bless your heart. Well, let me uh, let me go ahead and stop the recording, and here we go.